Hello, everyone, and welcome to Dragon Talk. Woo! The official Dungeons and Dragons podcast is what I like to call it, even though mm-hmm. there's not many others that are officially out there. I'm Greg Tito. I'm joined by these uh, wonderful folks, Mr. Matt Cernet. Howdy. And Mr. Chris Perkins. Hi. Uh, they are here to talk about lore. We will get to uh, recording two Lore You Should Know segments today. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the Netherese Empire uh, and the Xanathar. Mm. Uh, and uh, all that entails uh, be no beneath uh, there is water. There's no deep. connection between the two, as far as I know. Oh, I didn't even think about that. But is there? Bum bum bum. <laughs> Hinting at uh, uh, I don't even know anymore. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll get to those. We're going to do the Xanathar first, I think. Uh, and uh, we're excited that you guys all are here. Um, and uh, how are you guys in the chat? Are you feeling feeling all right? It's been a it's been a rough day, but. Uh, we're here to talk about Dungeons and Dragons and lore, uh, and uh, and we'll leave it at that. Plus, we also have a lot of other fun uh, things going on for uh, th- here on this Twitch channel. We got a lot of new shows starting up, uh, which we want to get you all uh, up to speed on. Uh, Heroes Graveyard uh, has been uh, every Saturday for the last three Saturdays. Uh, Trump SC. Uh, has been running this with Koibu, uh, two Dungeon Masters uh, who were with us here at the Stream of Annihilation, but they're running through uh, some of the uh, fun stuff, uh, and uh, there's there's permadeath in their game, which is kind of interesting. If you're playing in that game and your character perishes for some reason, uh, then you're out. You're, it's out of there. But uh, it's been a lot of fun, and, and I suggest you check that out. That's Saturdays uh, at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, a lot of fun happening there. Also, One Grung Above with Chris Lindsay as the Dungeon Master is starting up on Wednesdays. Uh, we're starting that one at 2 p.m. Pacific time here on Wednesdays. We'll be doing that for about uh, 10 weeks uh, here this fall. Uh, and uh, if you caught the uh, Grung adventure during uh, Stream of Annihilation, it's going to be more of the same, uh, only more, more Grungier. 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 Yeah. Grun- grungier, I guess, grungier. if you're here in Seattle. Yes. It'll be grungy. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll be Nirvana. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're feeling it. We're Grung Nirvana. Here they're we go. Growing from the sound garden. Um, also starting up uh, on Thursdays is Rooster. Oh, no, it's not Rooster and the Dragons anymore. It is now uh, uh, Destiny and Doom, a uh, new show uh, with Lauren Urban as Dungeon Master. She will actually be playing in the uh, one Grung Above uh, show, uh, but she is a fantastic dungeon master here, local in Renton. She's an oboist. You might know her as Oboe Crazy here in the chat. Uh, she comes in and hangs out a lot as she's working on her reads, uh, making them all ready for 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 symphony uh, performance. And uh, yeah, she'll be uh, starting up with a whole bunch of folks from uh, the Rooster Teeth community as well as Achievement Hunter. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. Uh, and uh, they've got a really great uh, cast, as I said, as well as a, a really cool storyline. So I'm looking forward to that. And that is on. Thursdays at 3 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, also new on the weekend is uh, Encounter Roleplay, uh, doing a Learn to Play uh, with Tomb of uh, Annihilation. So Will Jones from Encounter Roleplay is uh, uh, running his cast uh, through things and uh, then pausing after about 45 minutes to an hour or so and talking through uh, what the choices he made as Dungeon Master. So it's a great way to, uh, if you're interested in figuring out how to Dungeon Master or how to play Dungeons & Dragons, to uh, take a step back and, and talk about the game as it's happening in real time. I think that's a really cool idea. And uh, you fledgling Dungeon masters out there uh it's a great way to uh to kind of learn and figure out what's what's going on in the heads of of people um as they're you know create crafting the story um so uh some people wish chris perkins was doing that in the middle of acquisitions incorporated perhaps that'd be interesting <laughs> little soliloquy <laughs> yeah <damn> exactly soliloquy. <laughs> this is what's really happening yeah. and what i'm what the choices that i'm making each step of the way the trick is just not to let the players know exactly <laughs> they have to put in your plugs right they have to go in their little cone yeah. of silence yeah uh, and uh, Girls Guts Glory is returning uh, on the weekend. They will be streaming on Sundays at 3 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, and uh, it's been, uh, they have a new Dungeon Master. Uh, Laura uh, is doing wonderful. Uh, Kim Hidalgo will be playing alongside it. And then there's a new cast member, Kellen Coleman, uh, who is an actress that I've seen in a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and I'm really excited that she's uh, uh, joining the cast. I know they had played with her a bunch of times and her schedule didn't match mm-hmm. up ahead of time. So now she's playing with them and uh, it's it's a really good fun time. They did their first episode Sorry. Gosh, yesterday. Yep. Yeah, was that just yesterday? Yep. So much has happened. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's uh, been really fantastic, and they're going to get better and better at doing more and more streaming uh, uh, all this, this entire fall. I think they're going to be ending in December, so very excited about that as well. 
Um, and uh, for those of you uh, who've been paying attention to what's been happening this summer, Maze Arcana is returning. They're moving from 7 p.m. to 6 p.m. on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Uh, that's also Pacific time. And then High Rollers uh, is uh, switching up from Uncharted Territory and doing Dead Reckoning on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Pacific time. So they'll be hitting more of their prime time in the U.K., uh, but for us it'll be 10 a.m. So if those of you have got uh, uh, the stuff that you need to take care of at 10 a.m. in the morning, make sure that you're also watching Twitch at the same time here on the D&D channel. Uh, Tomb of Annihilation is out everywhere. People can grab it. Uh, I've been seeing a lot of folks on Twitter posting pictures of them playing, as well as their faces next to the green devil mask uh, uh, with their, their their mouth agape. Uh, I think that's fun stuff. So that's if you like tweet Halloween it. Halloween costume. I know, right? Mm. Oh, that is a good idea. <laughs> yeah, someone should go as the green devil face. Please please make it happen. Uh, I'm sure uh, uh, you know, you'll get your, your minds going. Uh, but just to celebrate. Throw candy in the mouth. Yeah, just throw it in there. <laughs> Who knows where the candy's going to end up? It could be in another plane. It could be annihilated. Who yeah. knows? Uh, but to celebrate that release, we did the podcasts of Annihilation on our Dungeon Delve feed. So we have the Dragon Talk feed, uh, where this is all this recording goes, and then we have Dungeon Delve, which has been our live play recordings uh, on there. So there's tons of old stuff from Acquisitions Incorporated up there now. Uh, but now we also have ten full episodes from lots of friends of ours around the podcast community, uh, including Nerd Poker, Taking Initiative, Encounter Roleplay, Dungeon Rats, uh, Sneak Attack, Drunks and Dragons, Men- Venture Maidens. Dungeon Drunks, D&D is for Nerds, and You Meet in a Tavern. Uh, go check it out. They all went in completely various different ways in uh, uh, the Tomb of Annihilation story. Some latched onto you know, a paragraph in the adventure and, and extrapolated upon that. Some took uh, a full um, uh, side tracks that were in there and uh, Random Whole Hog. It's been really fun to see all the different and interesting uh, Dungeon Masters going different things. And maybe you can find a new uh, a podcast to listen to uh, as they play through some of uh, uh, the storyline from Tomb of Annihilation, Annihilation as well as their own homebrew stuff. So lots of fun stuff out there. And uh, there's a new DM-only episode called The Chulton Job, where all, many of the DMs who were uh, involved in the podcast of Annihilation got together and recorded a uh, special episode, and that just dropped uh, last week. So go check that out. Again, it's called The Chulton Job, and it's on Dungeon Delve, available on iTunes, Google Play, and pretty much everywhere you can get podcasts. Good stuff there. Uh, we'll be doing Extra Life uh, on November 3rd and November 4th. November 3rd from Game Hall Con. Uh, we'll be uh, streaming live from Madison, Wisconsin there. Uh, lots of uh, luminaries as well as the D&D team will be mm-hmm. playing. Uh, and uh, we'll be playing some here in this very room uh, as well on November 4th, all raising money for uh, Seattle Children's Hospital uh, and various other children's hospitals across the land. Uh, go check it out. Uh, I have an Extra Life page up. I'm uh, getting donations. Uh, uh, Chris, do you have yours up, ready to go? It's up. It's up? <laughs> Nobody knows about it yet. Nobody knows about it yet. So search for Chris busy. Perkins on Extra oh, Life God. and uh, have to do. start yeah. throwing money at him. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but uh, you did do a lot of work on the Tortle Package. Uh, I sure did. You yeah. want to talk a little bit about that real quick? Uh, the Tortle Package is a PDF available for download off of DMs Guild, dmsguild.com. All the proceeds from this product go to our Extra Life charity. So it's done extremely well so far. And... Uh, check it out if you want to either play a turtle as a playable race or you want to dungeon master a, an adventure set on the turtle island of the snout of Omgar. The snout of Omgar. Yep. I love that. Good stuff. Um, yeah, it's uh, been raising tons of money and uh, it's really good content. So check it out. Uh, and uh, I'm sure there will be turtles everywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hope so. Popping up in every advent- D&D Adventurers League game to everywhere. To Mike Merle's chagrin. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he was the anti turtle He was the anti turtle yeah. yeah. Did you put him in as like their, their nemesis? No, 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 oh. no. We'll create a new one. That's yeah. the, 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 the Merlesies or something. <laughs> this new race <laughs> of anti tortles. <laughs> uh, what, what is the tortles like, uh, uh, or just even a, a, a sea turtles like natural predator? Like sharks. Sharks? <laughs> <laughs> is that it? Is that the only thing that, yeah, that, that can probably stomach them? Yeah, that probably makes sense. Man. <laughs> Man, well, there's that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and now I'm depressed again. All right, so uh, uh, the there's uh, so extra life. Go check that out. Uh, we have uh, the Dungeon Master screen reincarnated is also out, as well as the Tomb of Annihilation dice set. Uh, both fun little add-ons to you if you're heading to your uh, friendly local game store and uh, you're picking up the adventure. It's always good to get some more of those uh, for the Dungeon Master in your life. I'm sure they'll make it uh, much happier. Uh, as well, D and D Beyond has been doing really, really well uh, for those of you who are making uh, characters. The 
total packages available in D&D Beyond, uh, as well as Tomb of Annihilation. And uh, you can also pre-order Xanathar's Guide uh, on there now. We're working on getting all those subclasses ready to go uh, for D&D Beyond. When Xanathar's Guide to Everything launches on November 10th in game stores uh, with a special alt cover designed by Hydro 74 uh, and uh, November 21st everywhere else. So uh, D&D Beyond uh, and uh, Todd Kenrick, uh, who has been making videos for them, has been doing a great job uh, going through all of the subclasses. So Mike Merles and Jeremy Crawford has been uh, describing what makes those subclasses special. Uh, so follow them at dndbeyond.com and you'll get, uh, you know, he's trying to do at least a video a day on uh, all the mm. Xanathar's uh, subclasses. So it's a really good book. There's a lot of fun stuff in there. I nabbed a off-the-press copy, one of the first check copies, and was reading it on the weekend. So. Nice. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I'm so special. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's one of those products that you didn't uh, have as much uh, Correct. into. I, right? had, I had a little bit of input, but a lot of what went in that book was a mystery to me until I cracked open the book on Friday. Nice. Yeah. You get to feel like a fan. I do. Yeah. It's a pleasant feeling. I like that. So Matt wrote the Xanathar quotes mm-hmm. in the book. And they're all very, very hilarious. <laughs> so I'm glad we're going to be talking about the Xanathar. Mm. Uh, uh, because, and you can channel him as, as you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> we should get some more puppet hands so you can have all ten eye stocks ready there to go. go. Uh, all right. So, yeah, uh, a couple more things. Uh, Tales from Candlekeep is a uh, digital version of the Tomb of Annihilation adventure system game that our friends uh, WizKids are making. So that's going to be coming out uh, in the next couple of weeks, the Tomb of Annihilation uh, adventure system game. Uh, it's using the same kind of uh, skills, uh, I'm sorry, uh, mechanics that uh, Legend of Drist, uh, Wrath of Ashardalon, Castle Ravenloft, uh, all of those games are interchangeable and able to be used together. But the new one, Tomb of Annihilation, is coming out. And Tales from Candlekeep is the digital version of that uh, by our friends Beacom who are making it. So uh, really interesting stuff. I was playing a little bit around with it uh, last week. It looks like it's going to be uh, a really fun version of playing uh, a, a, D- a D&D style board game, uh, but in digital form. I'm, I'm really excited to check that out. And you guys should follow at Tales Candlekeep for more information there. Um, coming out, I believe, on October 11th. Uh, on on Steam, so go check that out. Uh, Force Gray Lost City of Omu uh, has been going strong. Uh, of course, uh, Matt Mercer has been doing a wonderful job dungeon mastering that crew as they get through uh, 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 um, Dungrun Lung. I believe they're about to uh, <laughs> get going in there uh, right now. So Jen Manganello, Deborah Ann Wald, Dylan Sprouse, uh, Utkar Shambudkar, and Brian Pasane uh, have been uh, just happy as clams trying to figure out how to get into Dungrung Long. New episode is today, right? New episode today. That's yep. right. Yeah, we'll be dropping at 5 p.m. or so uh, tonight when we're done talking to uh, Jeremy Crawford for Sage Advice uh, starting at uh, around 3 if we can get through these two lower topics, that is. Um, and then just real quick, of course, Twitch subscriptions are live. You can uh, check that out for $4.99. You can subscribe uh, a month. You get awesome emotes uh, as well as uh, being able to view all of the stuff here on this Twitch channel without any ads, which are always great. And I think uh, Pelham just realized uh, those of you who have subscribed for three months get a new badge today. You get your three-month subscriber badge. Uh, so mm-hmm. Emmy has done really good job making sure those look really shiny. I can't wait until you guys get to the 12-month subscription one. It's It literally glows in the dark. <gasps> <laughs> It's on a screen. It's on a screen. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for one of you to call me on that. <laughs> Thank you for that. It makes sense. Uh, you guys are awesome in the chat. Thank you for uh, uh, staying with us. Uh, and those of you who have subscribed for as long as you have, you are amazing. And uh, we uh, love creating all the fun stuff that we have going on here. We have um, a nice graphic with all the new shows on here. And it's kind of crazy. I think Nathan Stewart just uh, said the other day, la- a year ago at this time, we had one show on this, this Twitch channel. But it was a good one. It was a really great show. <laughs> Dice Camera Action. Uh, Still on. It was, uh, yeah, the, the anchor for what we're doing here. Uh, and it uh, you know, was a test case in many ways, so yeah. thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, but it showed that people really wanted to watch this kind of live uh, content, and now we have uh, uh, hours and hours, I want to say two dozen hours of, of content every week uh, coming at you uh, from Dungeons & Dragons stuff. So big shout-out to uh, those of you who are sticking around and watching a lot of it, uh, and as well as uh, uh, you guys for helping to, to make it awesome. Uh, and a, a shout out to Ryan and Pelham, of course, for, for making it a, a thing, too. Yes, indeed. You guys uh, do the good work. Make it possible. Yes. Oh, all right, good. And he's the, he's the cutie in the beanie, Inez666, in case you're wondering. His name's Ryan. <laughs> he does good stuff. <laughs> his phone number is. His phone number is 425. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, we're going to get to going and recording. What do you think, Ryan? Sound like a plan? Nice. I heard the clicks. That means it's. It's happening. You guys don't hear that, but I hear it, and it means it's real. 
All right, so we're going to do uh, the Xanathar first, correct? Sure. All right. Yep, Let's sounds good. All right. The Xanathar would want it that way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Who's, so you're going to be channeling him the entire time? <laughs> I don't think I can. <laughs> Let's get weird. All right, let's yeah. do it. <laughs> uh, welcome to another segment of. Oh God, I screwed it up already. I was going to say sage advice. Disintegrated. Disintegrated. <laughs> <laughs> Next minion. Next minion. <laughs> welcome to lore you should know. The segment where we delve deep into Dungeons and Dragons lore from the Forgotten Realms and give you little uh, tidbits that you can infect into your game. Uh, I am Greg Tito, and I'm joined by these wonderful lore masters. Hello, I'm Matt Cernet. And I'm Chris Perkins. And today we are going to talk about the Xanathar. That's right, the beholder crime lord who lives beneath the city of Waterdeep. Mm -hmm. Does he rule Skullport? Is that like his domain or is Skullport also a big part of it? Well, there's a lot beneath the city of Waterdeep. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Skullport is a a location uh, adjoining the great dungeon of Undermountain, which the Xanathar has now recently claimed. The Undermountain is his as well? Well, no. no oh, but no. Skullport, Skullport is, yeah. is the yeah. area that he's running. Right. Yeah. So we talked about Waterdeep on it's a previous... His corner. It's his corner of Undermountain. Okay, All right. Yeah, that he's like, this is yeah. mine. All right. Uh, so yeah, we've talked about Waterdeep and the you know, all the uh, uh, the founding of that as well as why it was called that. It's got a mm. deep harbor called Waterdeep Harbor, which mm-hmm. makes a lot of sense yep. once, you, once you put that together. Yep. <laughs> uh, but we're going to focus on, on the Xanathar and, and, and his crime syndicate. Now, how long has, has the Xanathar been involved in? It ha- hasn't been the same individual the whole time, has it? Uh, well, uh, no. no. Um, <laughs> Sorry, that's a leading so, question. So the, the Xanathar uh, shows up originally in uh, Waterdeep in the North. I believe that's the first place. That's right. It was a first edition, mm-hmm. one of the first uh, kind of uh, module-like source books that we produced for Forgotten Realms, mm-hmm. um, FR1. And he appeared on the cover with some of his cronies. It was a very sort of famous Keith Parkinson illustration. And, uh, yeah, he made his grand appearance there. And so in uh, in the uh, computer game Eye of the Beholder, mm. uh, the end of that computer game is facing off against the Xanathar, which if you're going to go play that computer game, just wander around the block of buildings until you come to his back and hit him and then wander back around and hit him again. Just do that over and over again. You'll be, um, so <laughs> <laughs> you get so many in- <laughs> Easter eggs here. Or on it's even now. easier. He can't get out of the one room, so just walk in through the door, hit him, and then walk out again, and then walk, do that, repeat, and then he dies. So um, This is this is <laughs> eight, eight-year-old Matt who discovered <laughs> this and he kept doing it over and over so, again. So basically that that sort of computer game sort of presumed his death in a weird way. Oh, okay. And, you know, because that, that, that's how you win the, that computer game, I the Boulder. And so later products kind of assumed that he was dead for that reason because there was a lot of sort of blurred continuity between computer games and comic books and, uh, you know, RPGs and all that kind of stuff. Of what was canon and what was actually right. what happened in the Forgotten Realms. And so um, there was later on presumed to be other Beholders that took on the mantle of the Zazanathar and sort of took up the the job of being yeah. crime boss of Waterdeep. Right. Mm. So that's where we are canonically. We say that there have been multiple Xanathars. I'm not sure we're codifying exactly how many. Right. Um, how did the, how did the the first Xanathar come to, like to power? Because usually beholders don't. I mean, they'll have like their their monsters and they create like a colony, but they don't usually get involved in in politics, right? Probably just boredom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I can do this, so I will. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a it's a sort of genius monster that um, doesn't have any hands, so <laughs> 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 you know, it's got to find something to do with his yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> so he created hands, which are his, uh, his, his yeah. minions. Yeah. yeah, one assumes that, like all beholders do, he came up out of the Underdark, and he got to a point where he realized he was pretty close to a major city. And just kind of parked himself underneath it and decided, you know, I can I can use my power to manipulate the dregs of the city and it giving me everything that I want. Nobody needs to know I'm here. Um, so I can basically just live out a secret life in this glorious darkness and have all my needs tended to me. And as time went on, as Xanathars got killed off or other beholders kind of followed the same track and fought until only one remained and that one became the Xanathar. Mm. Um was yeah. it always a, like a, a honorific? Was it always the Xanathar, or was that that come after uh, the it, first it one died? Came and went. So there, there has been there have been instances in the canon where it is, um, you know, Xanathar is a name, and then there's yeah. instances where it is the Xanathar, and it flip flops a little bit. Right. Got there it. was a beholder called Xanathar, mm-hmm. and now it's been 
turn into a title to some extent. Got it. Um, yeah. So, so what, uh, what, what, what kind of a, a, a leader is the Xanathar currently in, in Waterdeep? He is a psychotic, paranoid megalomaniac. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We've got some familiarity with that right now. <laughs> <laughs> he is, he is insane. Um, the, he has an organization that he surrounds himself with, and it's called the Xanathar Guild, although by Waterdeep standards, it's not really a guild. Yeah. Um, Water, certainly Waterdeep doesn't recognize it as one of the guilds of the city. Right. Um, it's really just called that to give it some legitimacy. But what it is is just a bunch of monsters and criminals and uh, underground-dwelling killers who basically live in fear of this monster and do its bidding and expect and hope for something out of it, uh, usually what they get is not very good <laughs> in the end. <laughs> yeah, so like to give you some context for it, so there was an organization in uh, Waterdeep that was a thieves' guild called uh, the the Shadow, Shadow Thieves. thieves yeah, Am. Shadow Thieves and Am. And uh, the uh, Waterdeep basically kicked them out and said, no, no thieves', thieves guild, guild, none. And Xanathar's uh, guild sort of occupied that vacuum, but it, it's it's sort of this weird, chaotic, uh, self-destructive <laughs> version yes. of the Thieves' Guild. And so, like the the sort of the um, the mass lords of the city and so on, basically allow it to exist <laughs> because it it keeps sort of any real Thieves' Guild from forming and and doing nefarious deeds yeah. and stuff like that because basically who's going to challenge a freaking scary beholder <laughs> well, actually, the one person who will is Laral Silverhand mm. uh, she is the open lord of Waterdeep and in Ed's most recent novel Death Masks she goes down to the sewers and confronts the Xanathar when she suspects he's getting a little uppity and he hides. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I don't want to deal with Laryl. He <laughs> doesn't want to deal with Laryl. Uh, so there is, a, there is a detente, in effect, between the city above and the, the criminal empire below. The Xanathar knows how far he can push and no more before yeah. Laryl shows up and cleans his clock. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Because she, she could take him out pretty, yeah. Oh, yeah. pretty easily. Yeah. yeah. I mean, she, she's like a, a crazy 700-year-old <laughs> Viking superwoman like <laughs> with, yeah. with, with spells. Yeah. Like. In the book, she just basically... <laughs> <laughs> she she grabs a bunch of magic items. She goes down into the sewer. She blows up everything that she sees between you know her palace and his antechamber, and then calls him out. And he's just like, nope, nope, <laughs> not coming out. Xanathar's <laughs> <laughs> not home right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So he he's he's not he adding uh, cowardice almost to to the yeah. well. To he's his also list of he's also aware that he's not the first to claim this title, and other mm-hmm. beholders have fallen by the wayside by their stupidity or arrogance. So he's he's proving himself to be smarter than most of his predecessors. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so and, uh, the other crazy thing about him is he's, uh, and this is not um, old canon. This is basically new canon. Is he's got only one love in his life. The fish. The fish. Which figures prominently on the covers of the Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Um, Both covers have the fish motif worked Mm -hmm. into them. And that's because that actually came out of a conversation we had with Charlie Sanders. Oh, really? uh, One of the writers on Key and Peele. Right. He's a DM and a big D&D fan. And we were just shooting the shit about the Xanathar one day. And he helped us come up with this idea that the Xanathar... Bad guys need to have flaws and things that sort of define them and in some ways... Humanize them. Humanize them, in a way. And so this idea that he's insanely um, loving of this fish and that this fish, like all fish, you know, they die. (laughs) And what that does to his criminal empire. Um, So it's it's just the imagery of... (laughs) His staff coming into like his throne hall or whatever and seeing the fish belly up in the tank and then the instant panic that ensues <laughs> and how everybody's running around like chickens with their heads cut off trying to replace this dead fish before the Xanathar figures out it's died. Right. Because if he finds out it's died, he's going to just lose his shit and disintegrate everybody. Disintegrate everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it also sets up this potential conflict down the road where smart heroes, if they want to deal with the Xanathar can deal with him through this fish, either by stealing it and blackmailing him mm. or killing it and driving him so bonkers that he basically takes out his own organization. Right. It's like the biggest <sighs> yeah. distraction in the world. Right. right. Yeah. 
Uh, so if anybody's wondering why the fish appear so prominently on the Xanathar's Guide, it's because we've sort of created this new humanizing lore about this horrible, horrible <laughs> creature. <laughs> Now, where, where, I mean, I, I know, how did he get the first get the fish? Like, where did someone gift it to him or something like that? Yeah, or? I think, I think he, it was gifted to him, um, and, uh, you know, somebody scooped it out of the harbor or a, a river somewhere and offered it up as a gift, and uh, he's loved it ever since. Interesting. Yeah, it never challenges him. It never threatens him. It just... <laughs> it just swim, loves him. It just loves... It swims around it's in its <laughs> tank and <laughs> does its thing. I mean, and to a beholder, that's actually kind of nice. Because a beholder spends most of its days envision plotting to eliminate those it perceives as enemies who wish to destroy it. Right. Because it's paranoid. This fish is like the only creature it's ever encountered where it doesn't feel that, that paranoia never emerges. Right. Yeah, I mean, the original cover for Waterdeep of the North features like a, a weird giant bakta tank behind the beholder that has, uh-huh. is totally unexplained. It just, yes. It's just there. Uh, and so there's there's some sort of inspiration from that yes. that there mm. would be a, a, that there a was fish tank. there yeah. was always mm-hmm. kind of fish there yeah. in the background. Yeah. Uh, uh, interesting. They float. I guess it's also a thing. Like they're you know they're, that too in a space yeah. that they yep. have to. So they're relatable on that level. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't have any. Hands. Does it talk to Doesn't the fish? Doesn't have any hands. Oh yes. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. What does and it say? Loving things. Yes. Yeah. 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 Just you know. <laughs> <laughs> does the fish have a name? Yeah. What's it called? Silgar. Silgar. S Y L G A R, cool. Is there yep. any any reason behind that, or just nope. that was just the it's just name a that came name. to him? It, it, literally, it was a case of somebody came up to me and said, we we need a name for the fish." <laughs> and I was like, "Silgar." <laughs> How often does that happen to you on like a daily basis? People are like, "We need something fast, go!" Oh, about twenty times a day. <laughs> <laughs> That's dungeon mastering for you. Yep. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It's, yeah, there's I. It's not like I knew anybody named Silgar. It's just a completely random name. It just hand, that makes yep. sense. Uh, so, so the Xanathar has this fish. He's got this organization. Are there like lieutenants that that we should know about uh, that like are named lieutenants that that are work had, for him? He's had several over the years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's been a a, a number that I, um, some are still alive. Yeah, I mean, some of them are old, are are races that can live long enough to still be alive, right. given the hundred yeah. year gap from them. He's had right. some humans. They're they're all dead. All the old humans are dead. Got it. Yeah. Um, others have had maybe threatened him or challenged him or got a little bit too big, big for their britches, so they're now statues somewhere or <laughs> piles of dust somewhere. And then there there are a few that, that kind of have hung on despite the change of boss. Yes. <laughs> despite yes. the change of crazy boss. Yeah. Yeah. And have managed to sort of continue to live this weird life in, in, yeah. uh, the, in either of the sewers, because sometimes he's in the sewers or, or under the city and in, uh, in various phases of the, the period and the, or under mountain itself. And, yeah. Um, and they just end up living this crazy life of creatures being, that gravitate toward him include dwarves because they like the underground, mm-hmm. dark dwarf, the Durogar because they also like the underground, mind flayers, drow, gnomes. Um, so uh, I think one of his uh, oldest, most stalwart lieutenants, sort of his major domo, is a dwarf named Amergo. Mm. And uh, over the course of editions, Amergo has transformed. He, he started off as a dwarf, then he turned into a, like a half minotaur, and now he's back to being a dwarf again. Um, it, was, it was just a polymorph spell that was cast yeah. on him. And uh, we had Richard Witters, our uh, senior art director, do some concept art for Amergo um, just so we would have it. And uh, to sort of preserve the minotaur quality, we basically decided he's a shield dwarf, but he's got basically a minotaur fetish. He likes all things minotaur and mazes and all that kind of stuff. So oh, okay. he's got a horned helm that kind of makes him look like a minotaur and stuff like that, but he's a dwarf. Makes sense. Um, mm-hmm. And then when what's uh, how does the guild make money? Is it just from stealing? Does it make money? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Is it, is, it just, uh, is it just like a terrorist group so that just goes around? So, it, I mean, it's had um, various nefarious activities ascribed to it in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, slavery being one of the, the, the big ones. At one point in time, um, the uh, Skullport, like the, a big part of Skullport's sort of import-export thing was slavery. Um, because there is a um, there's no slaves allowed in Waterdeep, uh, right. but um, Skullport is sort of an exception to those rules. A lot of yeah. things are are exceptions to the rules of Skullport, um, and uh, and so there's a lot of places up and down the Sword Sword Coast that um, are 
willing to use and employ employ slaves um <laughs> but uh but like it, it's it's something that's sort of frowned upon and banned in water deep and so that's the only of, way you can do it is yeah. is in skullport and to go down and uh, mm-hmm. uh i know from playing the board game lords of Waterdeep deep uh and the scoundrels of skullport expansion that's where you get uh, uh two fighters and two rogues and corruption mm-hmm. uh which makes a lot of sense yeah yeah and uh yeah. For those, yeah, it's also one of the mask lords that you can play as is the xanathar as well mm-hmm. right that's right, that's right. Uh, yeah Good stuff. Uh, so yeah, I love. Uh, I mean, I, I, it's funny. I played that game a bunch uh, and absorbed all the, the the tiddly bits. But it's fun talking to you guys and being like, "Oh wait, that's the guy that I, I was him, and I got all the corruption, and I won that game because yeah. I was the Xanathar." The other thing we say about the Xanathar and his organization is that a lot of the low level mooks in the organization don't know who the Xanathar is. They've never actually met the Beholder, oh, so they're okay. just sort of along for the ride and. The glory and the opportunity to, and they think just saying like the Xanathar yeah. means something. Well, they just know that someone really scary the, is the Xanathar, who's the boss. Of the org- you don't you don't want to piss off the Xanathar, right? Okay, right. So yeah. You, you go you go along, you you do whatever it is you're ordered to do, and uh, and you know, and who knows what it might be? Maybe you you break into some shipping company's place and steal their manifest for some reason, and you don't know why, but you get paid and and you do what you're told because the Xanathar says so, I and see. you know, and then that has. Um, reasons why that's meaningful right. elsewhere are there people like other authorities in Waterdeep who don't believe that there is a xanathar like is it kind of like a boogeyman type thing like the xanathar is going to come get you and i don't think the xanathar I don't, I don't have the impression that in Waterdeep itself the xanathar is well known as oh, okay. as like a thing in fact i don't really get the impression that even the idea of skullport is something that is well known in the city i think it's it's something that's if you were you know among the underworld set who who deals with these who pirates and criminals and stuff like yeah. that, you know, you might know of that. Um, but in the old Skullport accessory, it was basically said that the the lords of Waterdeep knew of Skullport, and certain high level authority figures did. But it's not something they advertised, and it's not something the commoners yeah. knew about. Mm. And there's there's sort of a weird aspect of of Waterdeep where um, it sort of tacitly allows Skullport to exist as sort of the steam valve, if you will, for all the underworld activities that otherwise would take place in the city above. And so that stuff, all the bad stuff basically happens down there. And um, they kind of allow that to happen uh, because they know it's there. In theory, they could do something about it, but they don't. If they need to find something or they need to get somebody, they can be like, well, at least we know where it is. It's in Skullport. Yeah, right. And they get to keep the streets clean. Right. Clean. Interesting. All right, cool. Yeah. Um, any other any details about the Xanathar we think people would be fascinated in? Um, apart from the fact that he surrounds himself with a criminal empire under one of the largest cities in Waterdeep, he's basically your average Joe Beholder. <laughs> <laughs> <Just Yeah>. Joe <laughs> Xanathar. <laughs> one of the things I tried to keep in mind when I was writing the quotes in the book is is that he's he's not human and doesn't really know how people work. Oh, okay. And, and so, you know, yeah. he's he's super smart, but he just he doesn't. He he's never had an he's never had arms or legs <laughs> he or doesn't, gotten it on with a you know yeah, a good looking. He doesn't know any, about any of that stuff. And so, a lot of the sort of humor in the the quotes of the book are basically him making bizarre assumptions or not <laughs> understanding <laughs> how <know>. basic <laughs> biology, human yeah, biology works. And, and yeah, like yeah, exactly. So, if you're a dungeon master, play on that for yeah. for if you ever have to mm-hmm. put the Xanathar in in, uh, uh, in your game, make it feel like alien. Right, because yeah. I mean, we we dealt with uh, the beholders in uh, uh, Volus Guided Monsters, and the weird life cycle, and we won't get too much into that right now. But right, the fact that they they are completely this alien aberration, uh, uh, it, yeah, we should not lose that fact. Yeah, yeah, because they're not so. They are, and they have no real value for human life. And when they dream, they create other beholders. They do occasionally. Yes, that's, that's the creepy thing to yeah. me. How does that even work? I don't even know, but it's amazing. Uh, all right, cool. Well, let's hope that uh, uh, the Xanathar doesn't uh, dream tonight and create uh, uh, triplets of Belleville or anything like that. Uh, all right, cool. Thank you so much uh, for talking to us about the Xanathar. Uh, how can people uh, get in touch with you guys and ask you crazy fun lore questions? I'm at Cernet, S-E-R-N-E-T-T, on Twitter. Nice. I am also on Twitter at Chris Perkins D-N-D. Nice. Uh, and uh, Xanathar's Guide to Everything comes out on November 10th in uh, your friendly local game store with that alternate cover, which we mentioned, uh, by Hydra 74. Go ahead and check that out from Buy the store. Buy it or be disintegrated. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Thank you, guys. We'll be back uh, next week with uh, another segment. Nice. 
That is now canon for how many mm-hmm. dogs in my in my game. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Buy it. Buy it. Uh, a doer thirty two says, "What kind of eye ray does Xanathar have?" Pretty much the the, 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 the normal standard ten. Array. Yeah. yeah, the standard array. Yep. <laughs> the Xanathar triplets are Xanathui, Xanadui, and Xanathlui. <laughs> that's very good. I, that is now. That is also now my head cannon <laughs> for when he dreams. Uh, good stuff. Uh, cool. All right. So uh, we are going to uh, do another one of these for the Netherese Empire. Uh, anything we should talk about before that? Are we ready to jump right in? Yeah, let's All just right. jump right in. All sure. right, let's do it. Netheril. Netheril. Not the Netherese Empire? You could say Netheril? It's one and the same. Okay. Yeah. Interchangeable? Right. Yep. Good. Welcome to another segment of Lore You Should Know. I am Greg Tito, and I'm joined by these wonderful lore masters. Matt Cernet. And Chris Perkins. And we are going to talk uh, about the Netheril. <laughs> I did it all wrong. It's not the Xanathar. It's not the Netherese Empire. It's the Nether Roll. No, oh my God! So Nether Roll or the Netherese Empire? I know, yeah. and I well, I, I like to humanize my own villain, uh, villain <laughs> <laughs> Let's start over. Yeah, it's, it's, now it's too far gone. This, this is how the sausage gets made, my wonderful people. It's uh, it's yes. Take two. Take two. Ka shoot. When it, are you ready? No. Not yet. <laughs> 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 All right. Do you like that pause beforehand when I thought about how to screw it up the best possible way? <laughs> 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 Welcome to another segment of Lore You Should Know, where we dive into Dungeons and Dragons lore from the Forgotten Realms and give you some uh, information you might be able to use in your game or just for your satisfaction. I am Greg Tito, and I'm joined by Matt Cernet. Hello. And Chris Perkins. Hello. And we are going to talk about Netherroll, otherwise known as the Netherese Empire, uh, from uh, many years in the past in the Forgotten Realms. Yes. They've come and gone. Come yes. and gone. <laughs> so uh, so what, what was the first uh, uh, kind of incarnation of, the, uh, of this empire? So uh, Netherroll was mentioned in uh, the Grey Box for the Forgotten Realms, the first sort of edition of the the setting that was released and it was probably mentioned in dragon articles before then by ed but i'm not positive i have to dig that up and it's basically um this referenced as a an empire of very magical human wizards that you know faded and gone by the time that um you know the present day so it's one of the forgotten realms oh i see um and it's it's where a lot of the uh artifacts and power and ruins uh that yes uh, netheril was a highly magical society yeah. was it a utopia was it was it did it feel <laughs> no <laughs> nothing close to a utopia was well it maybe, maybe some of the most powerful <laughs> netherese thought it was yeah. pretty utopic <laughs> but, like, this yeah. is great i'm the most powerful um, dude on the world so so the the history of this this sort of uh country or whatever you want to call it uh, starts about 5,000 years ago 5,500 or so from the, the current date of the, the realms and um, basically there are some human villages that band together under a king and yada yada but uh, eventually some elves take an interest in them and start teaching them magic and they, they learn, they learn <laughs> where everything mistake. goes to cram they learn a few things and uh, they start you know sort of taking over other areas and becoming more powerful and so on um, well, uh, then a weird thing happens. <laughs> um, this this mage comes and and gives them uh, the the Nether Scrolls, mm. and the Nether Scrolls or some of the Nether Scrolls anyway, are these um, golden magical scroll things that have all of these bizarre secrets of magic that are even um, sort of deeper secrets than the elves even knew about magic. Mm-hmm. Um, and it turns out uh, that the the person who gave the, gave these to them, that, which the Netherese call the Terraceer, is actually a Saruk. If you remember the we talked a while back about sort of the um, progenitor. progenitor races and stuff like that, the Saruk yeah. was one of them. And so the Saruk was the one that became the Yuan-Ti, right? Uh, yeah. Ish. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the Saruk, uh, he's he, the Terraceer is actually it's all it's, it's really complicated sort of history wise, myth, mythology wise. Mm-hmm. Um, the Saruk in this case uh, comes from a group of liches that are up in um, what is now Anarch Desert, like underground someplace, 
and uh, they wake up every now and then and have a conclave and then go back to sleep, sort of kind of a thing. And uh, the Terraceer kind of sneaks out. <laughs> and it's like, hey, humans, have some nether scrolls. <laughs> and uh, he slides it across to the table of them, and, and they're like, hey, what's this? And they, they, they build this crazy, fantastical, magical empire out of it, uh, essentially. And these, are, these nether scrolls have, uh, are they powerful on their own, or they have powerful spells? They, it's kind of, the, they, they... It's like handing cell phone technology and nuclear technology to a medieval society. I see. Um, but it's like, here are the pieces to build things with now go off oh you're not even prepared for you know you know a car let alone building a nuclear power plant but we're going to give you the nuclear power plant right now right off the gate right so they didn't realize any of the costs or any of the things that could have go wrong and so they do crazy things and one of the things that they do is um they make a a thing called a mythalar and a mythalar is basically a way of very easily creating magical items and effects that are permanent and so it's it, it gets wonky but but basically um there's a product that was put out um netheril uh or the empire of magic empire of magic yeah mm. and uh and that deals with basically being set in that time period oh, and okay. so the rules are totally different for for wizards they're not even wizards they're called arcanists um and the way that they ass- act, uh, access sort of magic is entirely different they don't have the same spell set i mean Everything's all weird and crazy. Do they not access the weave that you know. The it, they do, but it, in this weird new other way that that's sort of um, then later on when Netheril falls, uh, people lose access to. I see. Um, so the myth bars are this weird thing. And the other thing they do at, later on is uh, they uh, they discover the or did, or create the idea of heavy magic, and heavy magic is like this weird golden honey-colored floating goop mm. that, <laughs> that, <laughs> that you can kind of imbue spells into and then paint onto things and do crazy things with. Oh. And so then, th- I mean, they, they basically they're these super powerful wizards that the Netheril Empire becomes essentially uh, a cadre of super, super powerful wizards in yeah. flying cities that rule. Made of the heavy metal goop. That that's how of, they yeah, do. Mithlars and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and basically, the families of these super powerful wizards uh, rule the societies. And if you're on those those uh, cities, um, they have like heavy magic wrestling parties where you're just like <laughs> rolling around and it's getting covered in your face. And I'm glad you went there because that's where yeah. my mind was. Right, yeah. that are like you know there, there's concerts and there's heavy goop yeah. going everywhere. <laughs> Everybody's just covered in it. So this empire is going to last forever. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> they do all this crazy stuff, and, and and if you're in that city, it's you're pretty well off. If you're one of the noble families, you do really well. I mean, it's sort of an oligarchy kind of, right? Right. right. And then if you're on the city, you're you're, you're better off than than not. And if you're on the ground, ye, yeah, sucks to be you. Right. <laughs> we're the best. It's kind of we'll like take this all your food. Weird Bronze Age, yeah. you know, Conan, survival of the fittest, you know, kind of place. How many how many wall how many cities were there? How many floating cities were there? Oh gosh, um, there were at least a dozen. Yeah. That, yeah oh I mean, wow. It, so it's not just a handful. It's yeah. like they ha- they have enough. Yeah. And do they could they travel? Like, yeah, they could mm-hmm. float around and, and and do stuff like that. And so while that's just going on, uh, the Netherese are having conflicts with great races on the ground, including orcs and stuff like that. But the most significant one is weird conflicts with um, what's called the Ferrum. The Ferrum are alien funnel like creatures that don't look like they belong in any natural habitat. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, they're even weirder than beholders. Yeah. And oh, wow. uh, and they are a super magical race, and they kind of realize that um, they... It, the 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 netheries sort of contain them, but they don't like that, and so they start attacking and draining the netheries sort of of magic, mm. and so that gradually turns the the ground beneath the cities of the netheries to sort of a, a desert and so on, yeah. and there's sort of a, a, a long term war between the netheries and the ferrum that's going on and and so on. Now, are the ferrum all? Do they also have? The flo- floating city? No, or they, no like they, they actually live underground. Yeah. And, and so the, the war that happens mostly affects the people who are on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody who's <laughs> yeah. out in the middle. Uh, yeah. And so it just gets worse and worse and worse for them. And uh, eventually the, there's one particular um, Netherese wizard who decides, that, you know, the only thing cooler than being this awesome, super powerful Netherese wizard is being uh, the god of magic. And so I'm just going to take control of that. And that's Karsis. 
And so he he embarks in what is uh, later called Carcass's Folly and tries to basically take control of the weave of magic and become the god of magic from uh, what is then called Mistral rather than Mistra. And uh, that causes massive calamity essentially worldwide and, and uh, as the weave fails and all of those... Uh, cities, not all of them. Uh, some of them fall out of the sky. Some of them, um, by that point, have traveled elsewhere and landed, or uh, they've gone to another plane, or they've gone out of time because they. Some of them can shift themselves out of time. There's oh like cr- chronomancy is going on during this Nether Reason Empire. There's like a th- few thousand years there where they're doing stuff. Yeah, and. So, so, I mean, it's just, it's a wacky magical realm. Iron stones are actually, uh, from the DMG, are, there's a, they're ascribed in the Forgotten Realms to uh, uh, Nethery's um, inventor, essentially. So. Oh, no way, okay. Yeah. Everybody remembers the ion stones. That's like a, a, a good touchstone to be like, all right, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, that's uh, is it made from the goop? Is that actually what those are made out of? Are they? Well, I, at this point, they're probably just made in some conventional manner. But um, at that time, I'm sure, yeah, assembly line, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So suffice to say, Netheril went bye bye yeah. and left behind a big desert, right, where their empire used to be called Anorak, and didn't seem like they were going to come back anytime soon. When lo and behold, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Krakow, Krakow, fourth edition, <laughs> third actually. Third. Uh, yeah, you're right. They they premiered in third. Yep. Uh, because uh, we describe uh, their shadow. Yes. The shades. The shades come back. So let's talk about shades. Yeah, what are the shades? So um, these. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, put these on now. <laughs> one of the, the one of the cities, the city of shade, as it turns out, <laughs> goes goes to the. They put uh, down all the other cities all the time. Yeah, like, <laughs> but like uh, slyly, so you really I kind of have to think about it. Uh, goes to the um, basically the shadow fell. I mean, it was it was called the the plane of shadow at the, the third edition period or whatever, and um, and stays there. And it's it's basically um, uh, cozened by uh, Shar, the goddess of darkness and loss and so on. Mm-hmm. And the Netherese become uh, what are called uh, shadow var or shades. And uh, they are sort of humans, but they're tainted by their life in the shadow realm, and they look different, and so on. They kind of take on this grayish, almost translucent cast to them, like they're only kind of partly there. Yeah, there's, and there's like a weird detail about their eyes that their eyes are sort of gem colors, and and so on. So like that's a funny thing. So did they? So just to be so, one of these flo- floating cities. Uh, spontaneously went into the sh- the, the shadow fell, or was that like their goal? Was like, yeah, oh, we're things are blowing up. Let's yeah, phase into this. We'll go into this other yeah. realm, and we'll we'll hang out there for a few hundred years. Uh, and then, but they didn't realize that this would affect them I, physiologically, or they were like, ah, we're cool with it. Uh, hard to tell. Yeah, I don't know. Some, right. some probably knew and didn't care. Was it the leaders who did it, and then the yeah, the yeah, common the, folk the were kind of like, yeah, yeah, everybody else gets pro- just everybody dragged gets, along. Yeah, everybody else just gets dragged along. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, that or falling out of the sky. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they all get dragged along, and then they come back, and they are a great big evil empire in third edition. There's a series of novels um, that uh, deal with that, and there's various characters that st- that sp- spin off of those series of novels. There, the um. And that deal with those types of uh, individuals. So Erevis Kale um, wasn't originally a, a a shade, but eventually becomes one, mm. and so on and so forth. So Artemis and Trary also got yes um, shadow a bit. Uh, yep, a oh, bit. Really? So yeah, yep. it, there's all kinds of weird ties and so on. And uh, the the Sundering eventually ends. Sundering novels that are were the sort of kickoff for fifth edition for, for Forgotten Realms uh, ends with the uh, City of Shade. Um, Basically, slamming into the city of um, Mithranor. Mithranor. And uh, there's sort of a mutual d- destruction there that happens. Um, oh. And so the, sh- the Empire of Shade in 5th edition is more or less gone. Uh, there's, there's a bit of a. So there's also a, a, a concurrent rise of the uh, Faerum, who, who have been presumed dead for a long time. 
Oh. Um, They're back as well? Yeah. So there was a thing called the Memory Spire in 4th edition that it was this big silver spire that's kind of like a weird beehive-looking teardrop-shaped thing that just sort of floats around um, the Empire of Netheril um, and just kind of teleports about. And the Netherese don't really know what it is or what's there or what's in it. They assume that it's some sort of um, ancient uh, weapons cache or something like that. And I think it's DDO, Dungeons Dragons Online, that um, went ahead and revealed that that was actually a more or less hive of um, sleeping uh, Ferrum. And so oh. there's there's some forces that go in there thinking it's a weapons cache. Both, uh, like, oh God! <laughs> <laughs> both <laughs> screwed up. <laughs> Netherese and some sort of rebels against the Netherese. Yeah. They're both trying to get this this thing, and then it, it turns into sort of a weird super weapon where it starts Yamato gunning the ground and s- draining it of magic in order to sort of wake up the the Ferrum inside. So they go inside. They accidentally awaken this machine that starts draining the the landscape of magic and life and turning Stupid it back into humans. desert and, and then the pharaoh <laughs> get out again so yeah. <laughs> oops oops <laughs> I'm, I'm sensing a theme uh, yeah. with uh, with the netherese here yeah. and although the empire of shade is basically gone again netheril is once again sinking into the annals of history uh there's still some shades running around doing stuff because there was some shade activity in sembia and, uh, and uh, Neverwinter Wood. Neverwinter Wood. So it's like, clean up on aisle six. You know, you're just going to keep seeing more They're around. messes around. Yeah. Yeah. They're just like a bit like a bad that's always kind of yeah. there and you don't even realize that they've been yeah. underground. We, we can always go time. back there if we want to or have to. So this, just to go back to, <laughs> you said so much. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the uh, the, sh- the City of Shade and Mithranor, they... You said they like kind of mutually destroyed each other. Yeah. Was it through war? Or was them by being? Oh, it did. Yeah. Fall into. So, so the another one. The leader of the Netherese uh, was basically trying to um, steal the weave again because they, they keep on trying, and in this case, uh, empower uh, Shar to sort of be the goddess of magic, um, and. Uh, that didn't work out because it was sort of gravitroned into um, <laughs> <laughs> Mithranor. Mithranor has what's what's called uh, a mythal. Um, mythals are different than mythalars. Um, but they sound very, very similar. similar. Yes, so a mythal is like an actual physical object. Like it's a, it's a it's like a, a a beacon of power that emanates out this magic and make things permanent permanent and magic effects. Permanent. And you can carry it around and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, and a mythal is actually a magical field that is uh, sort of spread over a broad area. And it is, again, like an ancient magic that's super powerful and takes a lot of super powerful wizards to do it. So it's not like a ninth level spell that some wizard can cast. You know, it's like a ninth level spell that, like, some 20 wizards have to get together and right, cast, right? right. So oh, and like, the mythals are the things that are, like, uh, 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 defending Silvery Moon and things like that. Yeah. Yes. And, and these, are, these are sort of permanent fields of magic that really just last forever and do specific things. So, like, right. in Mithranor... Um, when the city was at its height, uh, you know, you any, everyone could fly. You could just fly, you know, <laughs> if you wanted to. So everyone could just Superman around nice. whenever they wanted to. Um, and other weird effects like that. The, there was no, I think there was no mind reading and no teleporting into the city allowed and stuff like that. Right. Um, and so basically they, they, the powerful elf wizards and so on that are left in Mithranor um, at the end of the, the, um, that those series of novels turn the myth law or, or the mythal against uh, Mithranor and try and sort of like suck it into the city, and or against um, the sh- city of shade and suck it into the city and it ends up sort of destroyed. It, it's sort of it's it's that or, or, the, or let the world get wrecked by you know by the shades. Yeah, right. Yeah, makes sense. Is there still a, a, a city of shade in the Shadowfell now, or is that also getting nullified because of, the, of this event? The implication is that, like, its runes are basically spread across um, wherever and mixed up with Mithranor at this point. Yeah. That it's a big p- heap of rubble spread across miles of the forest and stuff like that. Got it. Okay. Um, and then we also talked about uh, uh, Halrua and a couple of other 
places, and these are remnants of the the, the Netheril uh, yeah. uh, Empire mm-hmm. throughout there. Yeah. So throughout the whole um, rise of the Netherese Empire and its various stages, um, there are uh, sort of offshoots who various wizards who go off or conclaves of them that go off and try to set up their own settlements in different places. So Luskin, the city of Luskin, is originally Illusk, which was founded by the Netherese. Galtagrim was originally um, helped to be founded by the Netherese. Um, various other places yeah. are. It was uh, like a place out in the Sea of Swords, which is yeah. was a Netherese stronghold. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so when when we say, you know, if a person is a Luskin, they sort of look a certain way. They've got dark hair, blue eyes. That all traces back to Netherese ancestry. Okay, I see. So the uh, 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 that pale skin, pale too? skin yeah. light skin. Right, that makes sense. Yeah, and the, there's a, f- a funny, weird thing with gnomes as well. Um, there's there's a bizarre element in some of the lore where gnomes were peculiarly persecuted in <laughs> under the Netherese Empire. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. They just didn't like them. They were like, no, the, get the get right out. All right. So basically, when you said so dystopia, world building choice is a yeah. design <laughs> choice. <I'm> like, oh, <laughs> so someone hated gnomes, <laughs> 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 and they wrote it into the game. Uh, and there so are no gnomes in this campaign. Here's why. Here's why. And right. and so there there's the the follow-on of effect of that is is that there's stories about how like the gnome there are they're like gnome flights from netheril where there are like these these <laughs> you know underground railroads for, for gnomes fleeing netheril yeah <laughs> and uh they there's actually it's called the trail of mists which is this series of gateways to the ethereal plane that are dotted around the front realms um and that was originally created by gnomes and uh, and That's Nethery sympathizers with the gnomes, who mm. basically gave That's an escape maze, basically. Yeah, it gave the Neat. the gnomes a way to sort of have safe passage right. across the surface of the world through the the ethereal plane, and you have to have a certain like weird gemstone in order to get through each gateway yeah. or whatever. And but the cool thing is that the trail of mist is still there. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's still so, s- sitting there. Yeah, you can discover it. You know, yeah. use a fancy gem to transmit yourself ethereally across the face of Faerun. And it, it's weird because it's it's basically like there's an illusion of something, like an object, like a, or or a, a, the face of a cliff or something like that. Yeah. A tree, a stump, a log. and uh, But it's just an illusion, and you can pass through it. Um, but if you do, nothing happens. So you, you might... Unless you have the gem. Yeah, so you might encounter like a weird illusion of a big boulder and go to sit on it and fall through. <laughs> 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 but nothing happens. But if you have the right gem... Uh, you, you'll actually pass through that into the border ethereal, and then you can like wander across the border ethereal for a while till you find, hopefully, find another gateway. If you don't know where it is, you'll just wander across the border ethereal for a really long time, be stuck nice. there, and die. But <laughs> you know, <laughs> like most D and D campaigns, yeah. you, you have to get find your way out. Yeah. Right. Uh, I like that. I like that little detail that people might discover uh, uh, as well. I mean, I, I, I love that uh, the tendrils of this empire story kind of infects almost all of the stories we're talking about now. Yeah. You know, in some even way. though we don't say it in a lot of adventures, when you're finding magic items in dungeons or stuff, chances are those magic items were made during the time of the Netherese Empire. Mm-hmm. Right. Especially if they're, you know, yeah. uh, powerful or like right. you don't know what Stas, their effects are. Lines, things like that. Those yeah. were a dime a dozen back then. And now you're just finding... They're all relics of that ancient forgotten realm. Right. Um, did they have a coinage? Was there like a, a specific coinage, like a platinum oh or something gosh. like that that they used? Oh, or? gosh. There probably is something listed in, in – yeah. uh, because there, there was um, the the Netherese box set that was done, and then there was a, 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 a How the Mightier Fallen was an adventure that was done. and. Oh, okay. There's a series of novels even set during that period. So when you think about it, it's a strange choice to say, okay, now we've got our modern, our modern Forgotten Realms you know, setting. We're going to make up a setting from 5,000 years ago, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to reproduce. The not-so-Forgotten <laughs> Realms. Yeah. I guess we have to remember everything and, now. And, and we're going to do some novels, <laughs> like a trilogy of novels for it. Oh, okay, I guess. Well, but that's, hey, you know, TSR, they, they did a lot of fun things like that. Wealth of good stories. Yeah. You, yeah. Know, there's a, you, you can never uh, have enough, right? It's like the old Republic uh, coming back. Uh, Cool stuff. All right. Well, I'm sure there's a lot there to unpack. Um, uh, maybe if uh, uh, if you guys are interested, we will we'll do uh, another one on on a smaller bit of what you just said uh, uh, and uh, get even more detail on it. It's cool. good stuff. All right. It's, you look like you're going to say one more thing. Nope. I cut you off. All right. I'm good. good. Uh, what if people want to uh, ask you about uh, what brand of shades you have on? Where can they find out? <laughs> uh, they can ask me on Twitter at Chris Perkins DND. And you, Mr. Sernit. 
at Cernet, S-E-R-N-E-T-T. Perfect. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. Uh, uh, we'll learn more about uh, more lore uh, in other things things going forward as soon as Chris can take his yeah. sunglasses off. Nine ninety nine, folks. In a much cooler way than that. <laughs> yeah. uh, you guys are the best. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll see you soon. All right. Done and done. And we're right at three. So, so good times. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You guys are good. Uh, I just want to let you on the Twitches know we'll be back in just a couple minutes. We're going to take a short break. Uh, thank you to Felix Jonglor. Uh, even though you are a bad guy from uh, the Other Land series of novels by Tad Williams, you're a good person in my heart. Thank you for subscribing uh, for two months in a row. Aw, yeah. I like that. Uh, we'll be back with uh, a Sage Advice segment with Jeremy Crawford on uh, we're going to do Polymorph, I think, first, at first because a lot of questions on Polymorph. Uh, we will be back in a couple minutes. Talk to you soon. <laughs>